Hello, all my brilliant denizens. This is a very special former Network Executive Reaction episode. I even put on a nice shirt. Today, I'm going to teach you all about my rules for classic sitcom. When I mentioned I was planning on doing this, your encouragement was overwhelming. And so, here it is. There were also many of you who told me you hated all sitcoms. All I can say to you is that to appreciate the sitcom format and this video, well, you need to like sitcoms. They were, at one time, the most financially successful and best-loved shows on broadcast TV. To dismiss it with snobbish arrogance does not pay it the respect it deserves. If your goal is to write screenplays, sitcoms are great training wheels. If you can learn to write a killer 22 minutes, establish characters within a page or two, that's easier than slogging through 90 plus pages of screenplay. If you don't like them, please don't fill the comments section with the fact that you hate sitcoms. <laughs> Thanks. But first, I feel it is important to tell you where the heck do I get off telling all of you how to write a sitcom. Let me be completely transparent. My background is sketch writing. Did that for 20 years of my life, wrote thousands of sketches. 10 of those years, well, that was very successfully with the Frantics comedy troupe. I've written a couple of TV scripts that were produced, several sitcom pilots that were never picked up. I was head of TV comedy at CBC, read more than a thousand sitcom spec scripts, executive produced four shows, spent as much time as I could in LA learning from the best, like Bud Yorkin, Burt Metcalf, and Stan Daniels, watched dozens of sitcoms being shot live. I also sat on Norm's stool in an empty Cheers set for five minutes. If that doesn't count as resume material, then I don't know what does. I also interviewed for a VP position at Paramount, but decided I didn't want to become the person Hollywood needed me to become, and left it to start a new media and game development company. Still. To this day, I continue to write sitcom scripts because it's a great pastime. I love writing and I find myself brilliantly amusing. So if any of you want to turn back now because you feel I'm a poser, then I fully understand. You have been warned. Many of you who watch my TV Guide episode said just how irrelevant network television is these days. I'll be covering that in another video. But unfortunately, classic sitcoms still mainly live on network TV. Sure, uh, BoJack Horseman on Netflix, Veep, and Curb Your Enthusiasm on HBO would be exceptions. Back when I was a comedian in the 80s, pretty much everyone at Second City, every stand-up, wanted to either star in a sitcom or Right for one, sitcoms were a big deal. We talked about them endlessly. That was our pinnacle. They were such a huge part of my life and, well, now it's just drifted away as network TV became a smaller part of my life. Back in the day, a good sharp sitcom episode would be cause for water cooler chatter the next day. And now we have the greatest water cooler in the world in the internet, and no one is talking about broadcast TV. But because they still occupy a big part of my creative heart, I'm going to give you my rules for what makes up a proper classic sitcom. At the top of my list of rules for sitcom is location. I call this the container. Can I easily imagine endless story opportunities? Mary Tyler Moore's newsroom, Bob Newhart's psychiatry office slash medical building, the Cheers bar. 
There are many sitcoms centered around a home, which then defaults to premise and characters. But if the setting is a lower class Queens, New York home, as in all in the family, it clearly conjures up possibilities, as do the homes of the poor Campbells versus the rich Tates of soap. I've always had a hard time with the kind of workplace sitcoms where I could never stop thinking, shouldn't these people be out working? Why are they here? Taxi had that challenge. Wings also. Superstore eventually solved it, but that still remained an unwatchable show. Another important location sitcom rule is to start at what will essentially be its home base. Don't start someplace else and then bring everybody back and then set up the home base. No, the opening shot of your sitcom is at your home base. Next is premise. The premise does not have to be funny in of itself, but it has to have what I call a clear, strong, and interesting dilemma vector. The larger, the better. Let's pause here and I'll explain what a dilemma vector is. Most of us who took algebra and understood it uh, would have encountered a vector. A vector is an arrow. It has a direction, the arrow, and a magnitude, the angle of lift, that, that part there. If you can't remember your algebra, just think of it as an erection. Let's take the office premise as an example, a mockumentary about life in a mid-sized sub-office, paper merchants in a bleak British industrial town where manager David Brent thinks he's the coolest, funniest, and most popular boss ever. He isn't. Yeah, I'd say that has a good dilemma vector. Mockumentary. That's an interesting style. Sub-office of paper merchants, that's deliciously horrible. Bleak British industrial town, I can totally picture that. Incompetent boss who thinks he's great, well, that's brilliant. Now let's take third rock from the sun. A group of aliens has come to Earth to learn about its customs. To avoid detection, they have taken on human form, which gives them human emotions, physical needs, without the understanding of what they mean, nor the inhibitions normally present in humans. This is what is called a high concept premise, and usually has a high dilemma vector. All of that being said, a high concept premise does not guarantee success. I could go on and break down hundreds of sitcoms like this, but my intent is to not turn this video into a lecture. I think you get the idea already. Next up is distinct characters. Every character has to be strikingly unique, easily recognizable, and capable of generating dialogue that is completely unique to them and hopefully unique to the show. Dialogue should not be interchangeable between characters. If multiple characters can convey the same idea, then give it to a character for whom you can construct better wording. If the line is something mundane like, time to leave, that's not interesting or funny, and it doesn't advance character. Time to egress is a better line. Which of your characters would say that? See, not so hard. You need to sweat every line. Notwithstanding that Niles and Frazier spoke the same way because, well, they were essentially the two Looney Tunes gophers, Mac and Tosh, no one else on any other sitcom would utter the same dialogue in the same way with the same vocabulary. And of course, you could say the same for Archie Bunker, Patsy and Adina. Now, uh, you might be thinking, wait, Paul, you're muddling dialogue and character. Yes, but I don't know how you can separate the two. If you've created a character that included a hundred page character study and you still can't chuck funny shit into their cake hole, then you don't have a character. My first bit of advice is to 
TOSS, that 100-page character study. What you need is a, a personality flaw that a character conflates with their ego and will do everything in their power to avoid having it brought out into the open or confessing to it. It can be as obvious as Dick not wanting people to know he's an alien to Penny not wanting to admit she feels stupid around these highly educated friends and instead abuses her sex appeal. Characters not wanting to say things gives you lots more to say. Distinct casting. I'm including this because while getting to the casting stage means that you actually manage to sell your show, congratulations, you want to have an idea of the age, ethnicity, body type, sex of your characters while writing. Well, I mean, obviously. Even though that could all get blown up during casting or by network demands. These were the two main characters from the French original of La Cage aux Folles, a hilarious movie. Here were the two from the American version. As much as I love Robin Williams and Nathan Lane, they were exactly the same body types and killed much of the comedy. In other words, make your comedy writing life as easy as you possibly can. But what is a sitcom? Technically, a sitcom is a 22-minute play in three and often four parts. The four-part version would include, let's say, a, a two-minute opening gag that would be a setup to the rest of the episode, then three six- to seven-minute acts, however the time works out. Conceptually, this is what most people don't get, is that sitcoms are an organism. It is stable at the beginning, some pathogen enters the body by way of a character or situation. The cast attacks this pathogen, like white blood cells, kills or expels it, and then it returns to its stable state. I like this analogy because it conveys that all your characters are more than likely going to be involved contributing in dealing with this destabilized situation in their own unique ways. That's what makes it fun to write. And here's the controversial part. There is no character development in a classic sitcom. Sam won't suddenly stop being a womanizer. Diane didn't stop being an educated snob. Patsy never stopped believing she was still a top fashion model. A sitcom only works if it resets at the end and starts over uh, in the next episode. It's our comfort food. People confuse character expansion with character development. If a show runs for many seasons, there will inevitably be changes such as marriages and divorces. Sitcoms are not about change. They're about inviting our favorite people into our living room, seeing them get into trouble, and then enjoying how they extract themselves from their one or several concurrent dilemmas. Movies and plays have character development. In a Roman comedy, a person acting badly, usually the, the king, meets up with a clown. Comedy ensues, and the clown shows the ruler the error of his ways, and then the king becomes a changed person in the end. Scrooge is a good example. In a sitcom, the clown is killed and tossed into a dumpster. Please don't harass me with endless examples to the contrary in the comments. Most of the time, you're wrong, or you're confusing character expansion with development, or you've referenced a modern variation. Of course, there will be exceptions. This reminds me of the more than thousand people who pitched me sitcoms who would preface our conversations with, I don't watch sitcoms. I think they're dumb, and I'm here to fix them. I heard that a lot. Do you know how many of them were any good? Learn your craft first. Salvador Dali and Picasso started painting in a traditional classical style. Only after they got good at that did they move on to the styles we know them for. Learn to love the rules. Total freedom does not make for great work. Constraints do. Some final bits and pieces. If you want to learn how to write a sitcom, 
Then read as many scripts as you can get a hold of. If you're going to test your skills or practice, Frasier is, I think, the easiest model to write for because a lot of it is what I call thesaurus comedy with research into art, classical literature, furniture, and architecture terms. My favorite stories come from when characters create their own problem based on their character flaw and then solve it. If your lead character isn't funny, it's not a sitcom. Of the many scripts I read, most were ensemble comedies with a central character like Hal Linden from Barney Miller or Judd Hirsch's Alex and Taxi who were surrounded by a, a wacky cast of characters. Almost always their central leads were unfunny, dull, and boring. Their argument was that it's the wacky ensemble that made the show funny. I told them to go away and write 22 minutes with the main character trapped in an elevator and monologuing. If they couldn't make it interesting and funny, it meant they didn't know the character and they didn't have a sitcom. So that's it for my sitcom rules. I hope it's useful for all you budding sitcom writers out there. So before you break the rules, follow them first. Uh, you're going to have a much better time. Trust me. Thanks for watching, Denizens. I will finish with a scrolling list of my favorite sitcoms that I used to watch, listed in no particular order. There are many good sitcoms I have not seen. Sorry. What are some of your favorites? Till next time, be seeing you.